everybody. My name is Dr. Jonna Tolan Sullivan, and I'm your host today for Totus Tutus Evangelization Network. This is a platform that prepares souls for glorious return of our Lord and Savior Jesus as the kingdom of God comes to reign on earth as he has proclaimed. Now, today we have a very important person. Um, on our show. His name is Xavier Reyes Aral. If I said that right, he has worked since the 1900s, 1990s actually, on Marian apparition sites. And he has um, even collaborated with Monsignor Rene Laurentin, which many of us know very well, a legend and who actually died back in uh, October in 2017. And uh, Xavier, uh, Xavier continues now to study apparitions throughout Europe, Canada, and Latin America. So he has pu published many books uh, in France, uh, Canada, um, and no, I'm sorry, France, Germany, and Italy, right? And he is a fourth degree knight of Columbus and a grand knight of his own council. So he has just released the newest of his books called Revelations, The Hidden Secret Messages and Prophecies of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And so yeah, if you could lift up your book so everyone could see it, if you have it there. And look how yes. thick it is, you guys. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's big. <laughs> and and now, you know, I, I now I just we're going to be recording here. I just want to set the tone here for you, my dear friends, uh, for this podcast with Xavier. Um, he reveals the impending threats that are about to um, shape the 21st century. And um, they are through these hidden messages from very well known uh, approved apparition sites. So things that we haven't maybe perhaps publicly heard. And we have a lot to discuss. We were going to talk prophecies and warnings, a six week period to, for those to choose God, the miracle, the chastisements to come, the three days of darkness, uh, and the grand monarch. Uh, there's so much to talk about a timeline, a particular pope, uh, the threat of a Eucharist becoming invalid. Uh, what we need to do, what sacramentals to wear, uh, et cetera, confession, masses, praying the rosary. So <clears throat> as we go through this, my own comment to everyone here is uh, remember that fear and peace do not coincide. We have to uh, have a charity of mind. We have to avoid criticizing and condemning and we have to have a conversion of heart and uh pray for the church pray for our pope because the enemy as i always tell you will the god the enemy of god will want to employ the church from within so we have to be bigger and greater and rise about and be vigilant to everything that's happening so so we have to have a peace within so we can radiate the light of christ without you know out to everyone so anyway, um, you you need to be alert and um, be with us, right? So let us begin. And hello, Xavier. So I'm privileged and honored um, to be with you. Um, welcome so much to Totus to Us. Thank you. And the privilege and the honor is mine. Thank you very much for being so kind to invite me. Well, let's pray. Uh, let's start with prayer before we begin. And then we'll set off to our questions and stuff like that. And hope everyone uh, enjoys this uh, great uh, topic today on this Ash Wednesday. Um, so let's start with a Hail Mary. Would you like to lead us? Surely. In English or in Latin? Latin, of course. In nomine Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto. Amen. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you. May the precious blood of Jesus cover us. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, anyway, welcome again. And this is going to be a wonderful evening. I'm so excited. Um, there's so many questions. The book is phenomenal. And I know that it's very large. And I know that there's so many uh, um, things that you're going to, uh, there's another segment, I think, that you're going to follow up with on uh uh, later on with other sections to your book. So let's start with the first question that I I have for you. Um, so I understand that you knew, of course, and uh, for some time and did a lot of work, of course, with Monsignor Rene Laurent Penn. So many of us know him. So tell us, how did you get involved with um, um, Monsignor Rene Laurent in the um, in the Marian circle? Remarkably enough, uh, that goes back to 1992. Um, we just lost, uh, my brother and I, uh, our mother. We brought her from France to the United States for uh, um, experimental treatment the Americans had with a Taxol uh, for some sort of cancer. And uh, this Taxol treatment at the time came from yew trees. Unfortunately, France has no yew trees on its soil. So um, the French doctors recommended us to go to Florida and try to get an appointment. So we did, we lost our mother in the process. We finally, my brother and I were exploring. Uh, we were in mourning, we were going to Florida and we, we met uh, in a church in Boca Raton called uh, St. Joan of Arc. Uh, but we saw pamphlets about uh, two alleged young visionaries from Venezuela who came uh, in Fort Lauderdale in a church, I think, which was called Our Lady Queen of Martyrs, uh, to discuss the extraordinary experiences. We went, uh, my brother and I, although we were, being the oldest, I was on my guard, thinking that we just lost our mother and we were uh, vulnerable and we had to be careful. Already in France, we knew of um, Medjugorje, San Damiano, El Escorial in Spain, Garabandal, which had not been approved yet, and of course Medjugorje, which neither uh, had been approved either. But we went nevertheless, and we listen to these boys. We speak, my brother and I uh, speak, read, and write it perfectly in French and Spanish and English. Uh, or at least we like to think so. <laughs> and um, <laughs> in the course of the, the evening, my brother and I we machine gun the two visionaries with questions. So the minutes quickly became hours. And then finally, we decided to invite the two boys uh, to stay with us to help them go from prayer group to prayer group in the townhouse that we were renting in, ta in the time in Boca Raton. So with us, the days became weeks, the weeks became months. I had to give an explanation to my father, who was getting very impatient as to what was going on. Finally, my father came and joined us. And being of the old school, he was a traditionalist, not a traditional Catholic, but I, again, I repeat, a traditionalist, uh, ardent, uh, follower of Monseigneur Lefebvre. No. So for him to see two boys who came from the middle of nowhere, pretending to see the Blessed Virgin Mary, our Lord, and the entire celestial court was not something easy to accept or digest. However, Blessed Virgin Mary, on the day of our father's arrival to meet with me and my brother, promised, promised uh, on the night of the week liberation to sign that would unquestionably uh, prove a presence there. My father, being skeptical, this, uh, started laughing. My father was somewhat phlegmatic. He would not show too much emotion. But nevertheless, he said, all right, I'll come. We went there. We were in the middle of a living room with two sacred hearts, sacred heart of Christ, immaculate heart of Mary, huge statues, surrounded by two large candles. And in the presence of that evening, there was a young woman who would turn out to be later the future uh, sister-in-law of my brother Philippe, and with her baby who was barely a few months old. And I was already in contact with the Archbishop of these two alleged visionaries. Visionaries, and I was sending them him weekly messages uh, through faxes. The internet was just being developed, 
and um, multitudes of uh, miraculous conversions, miraculous healings. Finally, the boys fell in ecstasy. The boys, we prayed the 15 mysteries, the boys fell in ecstasy. The child, which was making a racket, finally stopped her noise, began to look at an imaginary point in the middle of the dark, no? but stopped being noisy, stopped being unruly, and looked still at a point in the middle of the dark. The boys finally, after, and they were talking, the, you could see their, move, their lips move, and not a word was uttered. They all of a sudden began to look at something of someone going up, up, up. At that time, a little child did exactly the same thing. This in itself constitutes no proof whatsoever. Granted, let's pass. But at that time, a little girl almost fell out of the arms of her mother, began to try to grab at something or someone shouting her very first words. Can you imagine what word that was? The word, a very, very first word was mama. Mm. At that time, my father was sitting on at my left, left uh, flank, grabbed my left arm and said, Xavier, je ne douterai plus. Xavier, mm. I shall no longer doubt. The following day, my father had a black book of contacts throughout France of everyone and anyone that was worth knowing either in the political or in the industrial circles of France, including the church, being of the old school no? and the traditionalist. 24 hours, he contacted Father René Laurentin's assistant and set up an appointment uh, with me, my brother, and the two visionaries. We traveled a few months later to Paris, went with Father Laurentin. Uh, Father Laurentin immediately received us at night. He was half asleep, but he quickly enough and got awake, listened to the boy, uh, machine gun in his turn, the, the two visionaries with multitudes of questions, and said, Monsieur, you shall not leave France before you drop by the laboratory of La Salpetriere and my good friend, Dr. Philippe Laurent, whom I know, Mrs. Sullivan, you know on a personal basis. Yeah, I do. So we went, we did the electroencephalogram, and although not conclusive, it showed correlations with some visionaries, the first seven, I believe, that uh, Dr. Laurent ever tested and sent the results to the Archbishop of these two boys in Venezuela, in the city of Maracaibo, to be precise. Okay. Anyway, uh, the investigation is proceeding on forth. The Archbishop has asked the two boys to take a vow of silence until the uh, study, uh, the undertaking study, to concludes. And I'm I was asked by the Blessed Virgin Mary to write books about the boys uh, to propagate her message if I would accept such a task. Of course, being 24 at the time, I was not about to say no, although my experience of writing was equal to zero. <laughs> but I did, it took me a full year to write finally my mother tongue in French. It was a major success, it did very well. In the meantime, we continued contact with Father Laurentin. I kept him posted of all the developments. As I mentioned to you, uh, Mrs. Uh, um, Gianna, <laughs> you permitted me to call it this name. Father Laurentin and I came uh, from very similar origins in France, same background. Although the difference in age was uh, radical, he could be my, he could have been my grandfather. I think he appreciated the fact that coming from the family I came from, I knew my place. I knew that uh, anyone that has, or rather, that white hair, commands respect. He did appreciate this upbringing. We were able to share family anecdotes of the war, anecdotes I grew up with. I heard my parents uh, relate to me, not always knowing how to keep their eyes dry. He did appreciate that. I appreciated his. And we became uh, mutually um, uh, appreciateful of one another and friends. When he finally lost his sight, um, I was in distress out of sheer uh, sadness for him. And when he passed away in 2017, um, I thought we had lost a tremendous light in the Catholic Church. One of the things he used to tell me was um, that we were living in, the, in those times 
in the times of admonition, the tongue de la des admonitions. Today, although in no way, shape, or form can I be compared to this extraordinary man with tremendous experience and theological background, it appears to me that we have left the times of admonition and we've ended the times of prophetic times. Yeah, I agree. Times that really uh, are, are of the utmost gravity. Yeah, I agree, Xavier. Thank you so much. I mean, I have nothing but the utmost respect and admiration. For, of course, back then was Father Ray Laurenton and uh, now Monsignor. Uh, I remember when he did uh, lose his sight and uh, uh, I just have so many fond memories. I'll just leave it at that. Um, well, anyway, in your in your book that you have done, um, you you discuss a great deal of prophecies, right? And this is what we're going to get into in the warnings and <clears throat> and miracles announced throughout history, um, even in Garam Bandal, Medjugorje, even though they're not approved, but still you echo this great deal of uh, the chastisements. It seems like our lady doesn't come when everything's great. I mean, she seems to come to warn us, draw us, and to protect us, and to challenge us, and to draw us into her mac heart to be safe and to have, um, you know, glory with God the Father for all for eternity, um, in that beatific vision. So I want to, you to be able to tell briefly, if you could, about um, your book. You know, can you tell us more about the events? to come you know uh, you echo this great deal of that in your book so if if you don't mind um you can show us a book and tell us more about the subjects if you will but then let's focus on more about the events to come yeah. certainly huge book <laughs> <laughs> this book was simply written and when i started it it was actually my wife's uh, suggestion uh, I had written many books before in France, um, but in this instance, I was always keeping an eye sharp for the geopolitical events of the time, the changing of society, both in my country and here in the States. Although I'm married to an American woman, a lady, and I have two little Franco-American uh, monkeys, <laughs> children, um, I, kept very, I keep very much in touch with the news in Europe. I watch most of the French TV here in Florida, although the American TV I watch on the side, and mostly French. And uh, the situation being what it was, I was seeing my France, my country, uh, go, uh, I think the expression in English is going down the drains. It was going crescendo worse and worse in matters of morality. France, I grew up with uh, as a young schoolboy, was the oldest, uh, daughter of the church. I grew up this, with the stories with eyes wide open with my little friends in school of the extraordinary battles of Joan of Arc and the French crusades in the Holy Land and the knights uh, that used to fight uh, for the uh, king and country and God king and country. That France, I, am, I regret to say, is no longer alive or if it is, it's probably hidden in uh, the depth of the French countryside for many French families have left the big cities for because they cannot stand seeing our country being no longer our country. So okay. finally, my wife was telling me, Xavier, you are itching. My wife, being American, goes straight to the point, doesn't go through any misplaced diplomacy and told me, Xavier, if that's the case, why don't you just uh, start writing again and publish something that in English I want to be able to understand it. And uh, try to share in this country that has welcomed you, that has given you two wonderful children, and that you love, um, something of value. Give something back. For me, it was a way to say thank you, yes, before the United States, to say thank you to God. For the family I've gotten, I found here, for these two extraordinary children have been given. And for all the gifts that have been given since I was a young man, since I was born. Um, so I wrote the, this book and I decided really to start investigating and start a campaign of investigation. 
about uh, the apparitions of La Salette, mm -hmm. which have been formally recognized and approved by the local Archbishop of Grenoble and the Dicasterium of the Doctrine of the Faith, which today translates into the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. Mm -hmm. By the apparitions to Marie Julie Jani mm -hmm. in uh, Brittany, in La Fraude, mm -hmm. an extraordinary woman, a stigmatist, who was nothing more but consumed out of sheer love and loyalty to the Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church. A story is probably one of the most remarkable in church history, along with that of Fatima. Mm -hmm. After the apparitions of Tilly, likewise approved by the local bishop uh, of Tilly in Normandy, they are pro uh, followed by the apparitions of Fatima, followed by the apparitions of uh, uh, Akita in Japan with Sister Sasagawa, Agnes Sasagawa, followed by a lady of good success in Quito, followed by a lady of Garavandal in Spain, which many people find it uh, controversial. And La Via Mestre which is the next chapter that follows Garavandal. Mm -hmm. But do keep in mind the following. Uh, neither Garavandal nor Medjugorje have either been approved, granted, they have not been condemned by the Catholic Church right. either. Yeah. And if they had any reasons to condemn it, they would not hesitate. But unfortunately, or fortunately, in that case, fortunately, none of those messages were contradictory to the dogma of the faith. To that event, the investigations on both cases still continue today. I've received it when I used to go uh, on John Henry Weston's shows and on uh, Immaculate Heart and Refuge channel on uh, Christine Bacon and on others in the Latin community of the podcast. Some comments saying, ah, ah, now I don't believe anymore because Xavier mentioned Medjugorje. One of the messages the Virgin Mary brings forth is charity. Not for, it doesn't come, apply to us or correspond to us to judge. Uh, the final judgment belongs to the Catholic Church here on earth and to God. We must be observant. We must be obedient, of course. But when an apparition site has not been formally condemned for heretic matters subject brought forth by the alleged visionaries, then if it is not the case, if it is not condemned, we are permitted, according to canon law, to discuss and to still believe. Father René Lanta, and that I began this book with a, with a paragraph, which um, <laughs> for me was the cornerstone of the lessons I got from him which he stated. Actually, I will read it to you. Would you permit me? Sure. I, I want our, our readers to understand a little bit background so that when we dive into these uh, uh, degrees of what is forthcoming in these hidden messages, they understand. So if you could briefly, that's good. Go ahead, please. My book be be begins with a paragraph which I stole shamelessly Father Fanny Lanta. He begins, it begins like this. The tree is judged by its fruits, says the Lord, and it is the only criteria of discernment that comes from him. Matthew 7 20, line 12 to 33. There is, however, an ambiguity we should be well aware of apparitions, where faith becomes evident, phenomenal in comparison to the gospel and to the holy sacraments. Excuse me, just a moment. I'm getting up there in age. <laughs> Even when the church recognized an apparition including Lourdes and Fatima, the most solemnly recognized of all, she does not employ her infallibility or even her authority since it is not a question of dogma which might be necessary for salvation and taught in the name of Christ, but of a discernment only probable and contextual. She's, the Catholic Church does not say you have to believe, but rather there are some good reasons to believe. It is beneficial to believe. The responsible authority itself can even say, I believe, but it does not impose this judgment under the penalty of sin. If I would not believe in Lourdes nor in Fatima, I would not have to go to confession. If I had reasons to doubt, it was in this spirit 
and with a completely open mind that I undertook my investigation about Lourdes, similarly, the situation would, would apply. Mm. Hence, with authority, the church can say, there are serious reasons not to believe. Then, if that's the case, it would be wrong to believe. Our judgment is called upon to a better church that permits the freedom to everyone of examination and discernment. This was written by Monseigneur René Laurentin in 1997. So there we are. That's great. It is, it's absolutely true. The only yeah. criteria for discernment is to judge a tree by its fruit. Now, I call upon all those that doubt about Medjugorje or Carabandal, judge the fruit. And what are the fruits there, which are mentioned in this book? Multitudes, millions of pilgrims coming every year, making lines wh whose beginning you can easily see, but whose end you can hardly see, going Amen. to confession. Got it. And I think that's a great stopping point there. I it's, it, That's beautiful. We're right on. Okay, so I want to go further into your book, Xavier. The first, first of your on your books, the the first, second, and third chapter, there are prophecies that are related. Now we're gonna we need to get into the prophecies. I want we want to focus on 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 this. I um, all of us who are watching, we're all with you. We all understand about believing or not. Uh, um, so let let us just um your prophet the prophecies that are related therefore um refer to a great deal about in in the first three chapters uh, first second third a great monarch okay um that will be coming to restore the papacy and the society can, now can you just tell us more about this person of this great monarch so we understand what you're talking about there Yes, absolutely. First of all, one of the uh, principal instructions that we that come along with these particular descriptions and prophecies given by our Lord and by the Blessed Virgin Mary, particularly to La Salette and to La Frode, is this, and to Tilly in Normandy, is this, we are not to try to find out the identity of this great monarch who today is alive. This Do you great know monarch, this guy? Do you know he is alive today? Yes. Uh, I mean, great okay, go ahead. Uh, how do you know? I, I mean, who is it? I mean, how do you know this? I know. Okay. Uh, what I can say is simply this. This great monarch is the direct descendant of his uh, highness, of their highness, Louis the King, Louis the Sixteenth, and of Marie Antoinette. Okay. Uh, from the following the La Loi Salique, the Salic Law which means that he must come a descendant from male to male to male to male, all the way from Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette to today's descendant. Okay. This man is a Frenchman. He was born in France, but decided to live in exile. Uh, he lives abroad to this day. He travels. He's Catholic, practicing Catholic. He's an extraordinary, extraordinary man. He will be called by a privileged soul uh, who will receive instruction from heaven to return to France in the most critical period of its history. You know? um, this man will obey accordingly and will come to France uh, during the, in the course of a military conflict when Eastern forces uh, will have invaded the great majority of the European continent uh, and will stop briefly uh, on the Rhine River, only to cross it after, um, and to invade part of France. The invasion will not be completed. The Russians of the Eastern Europeans and or Eastern Europeans and Muslim coalition that will come from the Southern Mediterranean uh, will not be able to accomplish the task. Uh, the, while the Russians will invade uh, Poland, this Germany. is the timeline. This is the timeline we're going to get into in a, in a few minutes. So this uh, this king is going to be coming in at that time to say the papacy. Is that correct? He will come. His first restore, will... not say, but restore the papacy and the society. Is that correct? That's correct. 
Okay. His first task will be to throw the uh, invaders out of France, out of uh, Germany, then the and the Muslims out of south of France. The King of Spain will join him as well, and they will start a campaign in Italy to restore the papacy. But after a war that will take place in Italy, that will last three years. Okay. And right. now, is is this part of uh, uh, Marie Jolie Janis' uh, yeah. prophecy? Is it okay? It is. It is. Okay. So now is this part of the three days of darkness or is this on the way to the three days of darkness? The three days of darkness will be part of the chastisement. In fact, it will be the last chastisement that will. So save. not this part. This would be after, right? Yes. I mean, uh, the three days of darkness would be after of this. Is that correct? Yes, it will be okay. the last thing that will, that will take place gotcha. before the restoration of the church and of the world. Now, is this French prince that we're talking about right now that we're listening? Um, uh, I mean, if he was listening right now, <laughs> if he was, you never know, uh, what message would you want to convey to him? <laughs> I was asked the exact I mean, he's same alive, question. right? Yes, he's alive. Um, uh, and I got that confirmation uh, through another mystic soul. But that being said, uh, you're not the first one to ask me that question. Yeah, as a matter of fact, you're the second one in oh. a podcast. So oh. if indeed uh, um, his, uh, his Highness, whose name will be Henry V of the Cross, Henry or his Saint de la Croix, uh, where indeed to listen to your show, I would simply be, uh, respond or say that I take great pride being the very, very first Frenchman to offer him my allegiance. When the time comes, I will respond present. So that would be my response to your question. Amen. Love it. <laughs> All those that support you as well. So at the end of your book, um, on the second chapter, you kind of give a clue as the dates of the start of the prophesied events to come. That's on the end of the second chapter. So can you uh, tell us a little more? We have... There's so many things in there. Um, there's the sun darkens, there's four hours, 12 to 4 France is, there's a real darkness. Um, I have questions about crops and foods and um, can you just expand upon, um, give us a clue to the dates of, that starts this prophesized events that are about to come? Yes, there were two particular messages that our Lord has uh, incredibly now given to Marie Jolie giving a clue as to when these events, all these prophecies will start to unfold. Uh, in no apparition site have I ever seen anything like that. The only place I've seen that was with Marie Jolie in La Prode. And the message was this, that, and I'm going to just paraphrase, all these prophecies entrusted through Marie Jolie we start to unfold beginning the year 80 and 83. So there was no mention as to what century. Could it be 1880? No. 1980? No. 2080? Too late. It has to be before. So what possible point of reference did our Lord use? Also, I was wondering. Last, it took me months, uh, Jana, to finally come up with a, uh, with a theory. And my theory, after all, was this. As I was finishing this book, I was writing on another prophecy that Marie Jolie uh, received, which was that her sister and she uh, would be one day exhumed after they passed away. And their bodies, both of them, would be found incorrupt as a sign of the print of God's hand upon their mission. As being, among other things, not just to be a prophet, but also to be a victim soul. So I thought to myself, goodness gracious, what possible, what greater year of reference could be for Marie Jolie other than her death, which was in 1941, while France was still being under German occupation. Now mm -hmm. I began to think 1941, 1941. So let's add 80 years to 1941. And I did. And the result was 2021. And the uh, our Lord said between 80 and 80 in the year 83. So I added 83 to 1941 and we reached 2024. Hmm. Now let's look a little bit backwards. What happened in 2021? The unthinkable. 
For the first time in church history, the immense majority of Roman Catholic and Apostolic churches around the world closed its doors to the faithful out of sheer fear of COVID-19. Oh, Who would have believed such a story 10 years ago? What happened in 2022? Again, the unthinkable. Russia, for the first time since 1945, through its armies, or shall we say, small army of barely 200,000 troops in a military operation in Ukraine, causing a one of the most massive uh, military conflicts that Europe has seen since 1945. Now, one might think, well, it's, very, it's a world away. Yes, for the Americans. It's less than two hours and a half away from Paris, I plane. Mm -hmm. So for this, for us Frenchmen, for the Europeans, this is a war that is taking outside our door. It's right next to us. And the consequences of this war, we haven't seen the, the end of it, not by a long shot. Russia, despite what we are listening on, on American TV and on some European channels, is winning this war by far. And they will, there's nothing that they, anyone can do to stop their victory against Ukraine. The problem that this war is causing now is that Russia is being tackled and pushed against the world into an alliance, a very strong alliance with China. And this alliance, this conflict in Ukraine, where there is no reconciliation possible between the Ukrainians who demand the return of every inch square they've lost, including Crimea, a region of Ukraine, which has never been anything else but Russian for the past three centuries. And the Russians are adamant. They will rather die and take the world with it than let go of the territories they've conquered. They will not accept humiliation. And to that effect, we've reached an impasse. And according to Marie-Julie Jeunie and other visionaries, there will be a military conflict that will come from the East very, very soon. But before I do, and it will be very quickly, I should just like to point out one thing. Most of these particular apparitions and uh, secrets were kept secrets purposely by the Vatican. To give an example among others, La Salette. The secret of La Salette was hidden on purpose by the Archbishop after it was approved and sent, incredibly enough, in the depths of the Vatican's library. It was only found in 1999 in, by accident by uh, Father de Cotteville, who was the assistant of Father René Laurentin. When he found this iron box with the seal of Grenoble, of the Archdiocese of Grenoble, he opened it and found the secrets of La Salette which he presented to Cardinal Ratzinger, who at the time was the prefect of the doctrine of the faith, who gave him imprimatur immediately. Fatima is a perfect other example. The, the third secret of Fatima, the instruction that came with it, was not subject to any interpretation. The message was this. It must be revealed publicly by Pope, by the Vatican, publicly, either at the time of the death of Luciano Santos, or no later than 1960. Hmm. John the 23rd, when he opened the second envelope for uh, Lucia dos Santos wrote two envelopes, one which contained the vision, which we're all familiar with. The second one contained the explanation that accompanied the vision, with whose text is finally in my book. Mm -hmm. That particular message, when John the 23rd read it, he became white like an aspirin. And he decided, he put back the, the letter in the envelope and said, no, I regret, we will not uh, display this, mm, this secret. Uh, for it is not meant for our times. In other yeah. words, this Pope thought, and his successors as well, that he was perhaps wiser than God, and that God probably very, very likely made a mistake. It takes to me, it takes, according to me, again, this is the opinion of, uh, of an angry Catholic, <laughs> that it takes a lot of gall, a lot of presumption, and maybe a lot of misplaced pride on the part of this pontiff to think to know better than heaven. Well, a lot of them, not just that pontiff. There's a lot of people who don't who want to reveal a lot of those secrets, and it's unfortunate because it could have saved many of our souls. And right. uh, uh, in trying to uh, persuade it uh, uh, to conversion, not to wait to some kind of typical uh, world event where your soul you don't have time to convert. 
there's you're so a fear afraid that you won't be able to discern or converge or anything and then it's just too much people don't believe that this is a real thing and now it's a real thing that's happening and now we need to wake up and and not be in despair or depressed we need to rise up and do something and so this is exactly what your book is bringing us to the attention of so for whatever reason that happens Xavier right then uh okay um it's released I mean we, we d didn't you tell me that um uh Akita uh Sakawawa uh, um Agnes Sakawa Zako, Zako, well, um, yeah. So, so, well, I wouldn't expect her to say my Italian name, so it's hard to say the Japanese <laughs> name, right? So, anyway, so uh, when it comes to the third secret, right? October of was it October 2019 or something that she was it that that she gave it, it to uh, um. Who did she give the message? Oh, Cardinal Ratzinger. Bishop went to Cardinal Ratzinger. And he, there was the approval because it was, ended up being the third message of Fatima, exactly. right? Exactly. Uh, yes, in Agita, uh, Sorry. the last message that he, she received was on October 13th, uh, 1978, in memory oh, serves. Oh, okay. Which was the anniversary of um, the last apparition and the miracle of the sun in Fatima. So there was a lot of controversy also about uh, the Akita dossier, the apparition case. But uh, Bishop Ito was convinced that there's been miraculous, uh, the miraculous statue of a lady of all nations that began to bleed, uh, her body began to sweat and shed human tears, human sweat, human blood. So an investigation was made. Bishop Ito was absolutely convinced that anything that comes from God will automatically be attacked by the enemy. So Bishop Pito uh, organized a trip to meet with Cardinal Ratzinger, who, before becoming Pope Benedict XVI, was the prefect of the Doctrine of the Faith, of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. He took a plane from Tokyo all the way to Rome, or to his dossier, and Cardinal Ratzinger had heard only the negative part of Akita. So he was very perplexed. When he received uh, Bishop Pito, he said, Excellency, sit down. And the bishop opened his suitcase and began to bring dossier after dossier. The cardinal was tired. He was looking at it again, very perplexed. And then the bishop, Ito, brought, gave him the last message that Sister Sasagawa received, which I don't mind telling you. And it is uh, available today to the public on the internet. It mm -hmm. is in my book as well. Uh, it's hair raising. Hair raising. It's terribly scary. It's very prophetic. And when uh, Bishop Ito uh, gave it to Cardinal Ranzinger, Card the Cardinal read it and posed it. So the Bishop continued and said, so you see, uh, Your Eminence, this must be taken under consideration immediately. The Cardinal stopped Bishop Ito and said, Your Excellency, there will, there will be no more uh, conversation on the matter. This matter is closed as far as I'm concerned. God, and poor Bishop Ito didn't understand, but Your Eminence, he said, you have to give it a chance. You have to study what I'm brought for you forth. This is years of investigation and work. And Cardinal Rasisha said, no, 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 Excellency, you don't seem to understand. There will be no further conversation on this matter, simply for one thing. As of today, the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith will declare the case of Akita as being worthy of belief, mm -hmm. which is equivalent to an approval. It's a formal recognition of Rome that Akita is indeed worthy of belief. It is an approval. And he said, you see, ex Excellency, the reason what made me decide on the spot that this apparition case is indeed a true one is because the message of Akita you just gave me, received by good sisters of Sagawa, is in fact the third secret of Fatima. Wow. Said in different words, perhaps, but the same secret. Amen. Okay, wow. Okay, now... That's exactly what I wanted to get. Okay, and we're going to switch tunes here because I have a lot of questions. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, this is your big book, big book. Um, all right. So the king of the great monarch is alive. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. He's a stigmatist? No. Okay. Good. Uh, he is alive. Okay. Now, the timeline with France can we get this, the timeline that's going to happen? You said France is the first country to collapse on its knees 
and will be the first country to get back up with third yes. world war. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. That's okay. why France plays such an important role in these prophecies. And it's supposed to take place with the use Eastern European enemy in and uh, as Russia. Is that correct? Yes, and the Muslims. And the, the Muslim Muslims. And you know, the Russians and the Muslims don't get along. At well, all. Uh, they do get along in Syria and with Iran. They do. Okay, so why don't you expand about that? You know, it covers the northern and southern planks before the beating of the NATO defenses. That just tell everyone. I mean, I have written, I can read happen. it. But... And that will also answer, uh, we'll kill two birds with one stone. This okay. will answer this question and give you a, a timeline. Okay. We'll begin with the change of a monarch in England. Okay. When one queen of England will cease to be and will be replaced by a new monarch. In the course of this monarch... Well, that uh, happened. Queen... queen Elizabeth died, right? Yes. Okay. And I did this announced it before her death. Okay. Uh, on, the, on her replacement from her monarchy to another one, what we know as the United Kingdom will implode into four sovereign nations. Okay. England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. Then afterwards, there will be tensions between England, um, Jerusalem, and Persia. Those were the words used at the time. Keep in mind that in the time, there was no such nation as Israel and no such nation as Iran. So in this today translates into tensions, geopolitical tensions between England and Israel against Iran. Okay. When that happens, there will be finally uh, revolutions that will start spreading after tensions will come from the east. Those revolutions will be principally in France and in Italy, but they will be also in other countries. But this will take such amplitude that nations and cities such as Paris and Rome will see particularly Frenchmen of what we call in France, paper Frenchmen. In other words, foreigners that have French nationality through their passport because they got nationalized. But they are as, as French, <coughs> excuse me, as I am from Laos. You know? So they are absolutely no French. They're not French in their heart nor in their mind. They are there simply out of opportunism, not mm -hmm. altruism. Mm -hmm. So according to Marie Julie those revolutions will take place. There will be such anger and devastation that France and Italy will be divided in two different camps. Those who remain loyal to the French laws of the Republic and the French culture, and those who just came in and want to change the rules, the, the culture to a more an international one. In mm -hmm. the meantime, in Eastern Europe, there will be geopolitical tensions that will uh, come forth to such a point that the Pope will supposedly leave Rome to Moscow to meet with either the head of state and or with the head patriarch of the Orthodox Church. The whole trip will be nothing less than a fiasco. Mm -hmm. The Pope will return to Rome, and when he will return, there will be other conflicts that will spread in different parts of Europe. Already today, uh, in times when there are talks about the Pope leaving for, for Moscow in a moment now, there are tensions between Serbia and the, and the Republic of Kosovo, to the point that both nations have sent some military units at the borderline. They are already territorial disputes. Okay. So if indeed the Pope goes there and returns, God knows what will happen. Russia is already supporting Serbia. To continue to that uh, lime time frame, at that moment, Russia will wipe out all the resistance from the nations who will have put all their defenses and resources in Eastern Europe. Russia will vanquish all resistance and will spread very quickly to a Poland and to a Germany who will have no further resources or uh, defenses or ammunitions or equipment to be strong enough to stop or halt the Russian advance. The Russians will secure their right and left flank by conquering through blitzkrieg Scandinavia, which means Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, Holland and Belgium, and Germany. It will cross quickly the plains of Austria and will enter Switzerland. Once they reach the Rhine River with all the remnants of NATO troops going into France, they will stop for a brief pause because France is a nuclear power. And since General de Gaulle, the political, the politics of this situation is any foreign troop sets foot within one inch square of French soil will be re responded with a nuclear counterattack. Mm -hmm. The Russians will think it a bluff, will throw the dice and will rush through France for three principal directions, 
not Paris first. Orléans will be the main attack, where the Russians will cross France like a knife into butter. The, the second attack will be Paris, Normandy and Picardy. And the third one, crossing through Switzerland, they will reach central France. In the meantime, the Muslim coalition will disembark in South Italy, in South France, and in La Costa del Sol, Spain, and Andalusia in southern Spain, and will get great um, territorial advances. The Spanish, the French, and the Italians, taken completely by surprise, will not be able to resist them for very long. The Spanish king will leave the country for a very, very short period of time, will come back, and will fight the Muslims. In the meantime, while the remnants of NATO fights in France, the advances of Russia, France, nor the allies in Europe will not receive any military assistance from other allies. This means the United States. Mm -hmm. And that uh, opened another can of worms. Why on earth wouldn't the United States come to the rescue of its own troops and its allies in Europe? This could, be, this could mean only two possibilities, or both. The first possibility would be that the United States would be struck so violently in its own land for natural catastrophes that he wouldn't he couldn't spare his resources to come to the aid of his friends hmm. and or he would have to face a great enemy on another front may the watchers reach their own conclusions it appears to me that china is growing hmm. more and more dangerously yep. uh, with its ambitions and military growth in the pacific yeah china is an issue we all kind of know that that's this big and then the french riviera as we know it to the southern italy um are they safe no no <laughs> uh, so much for uh, the french riviera <laughs> marseille according to marie julie Jani, during the war will will sink in the mediterranean sea oh my gosh and i regret to say paris and that is not just for marie julie Jani, also through la salette which has been approved formally by both the archbishop and rome La, 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 la fraude, Marie-Julie Jenny, has been only informally approved through a letter by Bishop Mo, uh, by Monsignor Fournier, who was the Bishop of Nantes, the, the Bishop of Jurisdiction of Marie-Julie Jenny. But Marie-Julie Jenny said that when the king returns to France and pushes back the Russians out of France, the Russians will withdraw Paris, will bomb Paris at night for two missiles, one that would come from the still occupied city of Orléans and the other from the city of Blois. It will be at night. And these two nuclear warheads will level Paris to, with such violence that the entire city will not only be vaporized, but will collapse in a crater that has no bottom. Only parts of Paris, among which the island in the center of the Rhine, of the city of the river of Seine, will survive. And only 88 Parisians, all in all, from the entire 10 million people population city, will survive. Only the version I said. A hundred less twelve people will survive the Paris destruction. Wow. Um, okay. I know it's shocking. It was yeah. for me when I read all this. Okay. Let's 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 that that's a timeline. I don't know when that timeline would begin. Do you? Well, if we were to listen to the clues. As our Lord gave Marie Julie Janine, between the year 1883, all this will start. In 2024? So between 2021 and 2024. So already began with the, the spraying of the chastisement with the COVID pandemic. It's begun with a war that is taking place in Russia and Ukraine. What's going to happen this year and mm -hmm. next? Only God knows. And now you have the. Well, uh, world one world order, and uh, uh, it, it seems to uh, it's a start to many things falling through to the prophecies that from years be before back in 1917 all the way up to to uh, Marie uh, Jolie Jani, and uh, which I know is you've taken to heart. So I just want to take one step aside now. Uh, let's uh, make a little attention to the Pope. <laughs> now, I know we need to honor the Pope. And um, 
in your book, it mentions that there are two anti-popes. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, it mentions two anti-popes, one holy pope. Um, and so my hope is that you can elaborate further on these. But I want to talk about, um, I guess I heard this on Christine Baker's Bacon's, um, you mentioned it on her podcast that uh, was amazing about the Anglican Protestant who mentioned about some of the open oppositions that this particular one Pope has been doing. And uh, could you elaborate a little bit on that as the Pacha Pope? Yes. Please. He was an Anglican fellow I went with, uh, English fellow. So imagine a Frenchman working with an Englishman. <laughs> not the best of combinations, not the best of worlds. <laughs> Nevertheless, um, when the uh, incident with the Pachamama took place, this Englishman began to address me and, and laughingly and said, ha oh, ha, you bloody Frenchman, can't you see you you call this Pope the true vicar of Christ? Ha uh, <laughs> ha, blimey. Well, that is no longer the case, is it? Now, this Pope of yours allowing idolatry, sheer idolatry to take place on supposedly holy ground, how could you possibly justify such a rubbish sort of uh, matter? So, and you know how we Englishmen call your, your holy father? We call him the Pacha Papa. So, blind last, I heard this man uh, vomit his profound disgust of the Pope having committed um, uh, a complicity in allowing idolatry to take place on holy ground. I did not accept it. I defended the Pope by saying, you, you're Englishman, you have no idea what you're talking about. If you've proven anything today is that indeed English ridicule does not kill. But the fact of the matter is, this Englishman, although he was blunt, English and pompous, was absolutely right. Yeah, he was. What the Pope did, by allowing, by participating, by being there with a heartwarming smile, watching these people kneel, pray to the goddess of Pachamama. And I invite your viewers to check on Wikipedia who the Pachamama is. Mm -hmm. She's a goddess, an Amazonian goddess. These people were on their knees praying Pachamama to give their, to bless their lands with their fertility and so on and so forth. The Pope was there permitted this to happen under his eyes with a hard, fatherly, well-seeing look. Forgive me. I will not admit this to him before non-Catholics, but what the Pope did was indeed commit an act of sheer complicity in an act of idolatry. It is idolatry. Two plus two will always make four, and however good-spirited you are, you will never make change an absolute value and make it five. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what happened. I agree with you with what you said, Jenna. We cannot, we have to honor the Pope. I am, as a Catholic, coming from a family that has origins in the traditionalist movement. I do not want to attack the Pope. I consider still him the pontiff of the Catholic Church, although he himself doesn't recognize himself so. But I am in open disagreement and opposition to him but I am not in rebellion against him mm -hmm. because I do not believe for one moment that's the will of God. We give more honor to God by remaining respectful to his vicar and his, Jesus Christ's vicar. As I said, although he himself does not recognize himself to be so. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is, if anybody is going to leave the Catholic Church, it won't be us. It will be the enemies of Christ. And we have to have mercy and charity to our enemies, that was one of the principal teachings of Christ. If we were hit on this cheek, we must offer the other. And very much like John Henry Weston did in Quebec, the last time the Pope went there, uh, is what we must do as well. John Henry Weston showed the example. Be on our knees with true Catholics and pray for the conversion of the Pope and for all those cardinals, archbishops, uh, bishops, priests, and religious who follow his doctrine, such as Ma, uh, Amoris Laetitia, such as those who open uh, wage openly war against the traditionalists, uh, simply because those traditionalists 
are guilty of the unforgivable crime of adoring Christ and the blessed, and not adoring the blessed Virgin Mary, but having recourse to her as an intercessor, the way our fathers and their fathers before them did for centuries and centuries before us. Okay, so I get it. I'm going to say so. I get like uh, very many Catholics who are very profound Catholics and adore the Lord and are, and and then we're human. And then we get there are many that are really pretty ticked off that he's doing idolatry in the Catholic Church. Okay, and uh, we're to pray for him. We do have to pray. I mean, many don't want to pray for him. They're they're, they're angry. I get it, but we do have to pray for a conversion because now we have a more important thing that's even coming to to um, surface here soon that we talked about, and I believe. This is a liturgical change in the in the liturgy, a liturgy change in uh, the mass that the celebration of the Holy Eucharist could become invalid through brotherhood of a change of language. Am I am I wrong in that? Or I mean, so we need tremendous prayer. We could not pray for the Pope because we're ticked off at him, but at the same time, we better be praying because prayers is things that change. See, that's just what the Lord did for to uh, for us and our sins. He prayed for us. And this is why we have converted. And many of us are changing because of his love and prayers for us. We have to pray yeah, that there isn't this socialism or communism coming this way and uh, for the Lord to allow the enemies to scatter especially those who hate him flee from his face. So you see what I'm saying? So could you just touch upon that, if you would? Is there a new liturgical language, if you will, coming forth that could change yeah. the validity of the transubstantiation of the Holy Eucharist? Yes. Um, I recently mentioned a new liturgy that will make the, that will actually uh, have the Eucharist celebrated during this new liturgy invalid. As of today, even Novus Ordo, which is not the best way of celebrating the Eucharist, no? the Tridentine Mass is the purest form of celebrating the Holy Eucharist, unquestionably. However, however imperfect, Novus Ordo is still a valid Mass. Whenever a priest consecrates the Holy Host and the wine, it becomes the body and, and blood, soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is of the utmost importance. The Eucharist is not a symbol. It is the same Jesus Christ who was born of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who walked on waters, who healed the blind and the leprous, who died on the cross and resurrected on the third day. It is the same Jesus Christ who we receive through this holy sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. It is not a symbol. Mm -hmm. Now, Marie Julie Janie has mentioned that the day will come when a universal liturgy, church, uh, will create this li new liturgy which will give options to the celebrating priest to consecrate it in the proper way or in a universal way to include all the other denominations and all other faiths, including the pagan ones. And okay. all these under the auspices that Catholic means universal, which is supposed to gather all the children of God under the same roof. Hmm. Okay. All right. Wow. Wow. Um... So let me just ask you another question. I, and please forgive me if it seems abrupt to one question not to another, because there's so many that I, I think I want to touch on for everyone to know. We just go from topic to topic. Please forgive me if it doesn't flow. Uh, okay, so um, elaborate a little bit more so we understand how the Holy Pope is going to be connected to this great monarch. Yes. I don't think it's this Marie Pope. <laughs> this it? Pope? I don't think so, but is it? No, certainly not. <laughs> I'm just trying to be gracious. <laughs> no, well, that was a valiant, my insight. <laughs> valiant effort. But uh, it's all to your credit. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. No, forgive it's me. All uh, this Pope has not, uh, is not at all the angelic Pope that has been uh, for Thank the you. whole time. Okay. So I understand how this. Holy Pope coming is going to be connected to the great uh, monarch. Yes, this uh, new, uh, this angelic Pope that has been brought, uh, mentioned in prophecies 
will be indeed uh, of the same, uh, will be a Bourbon, will be a far off cousin of King Henry V of the Cross, okay. King of France. And uh, the King of France will put him on the seat of, of Peter, will restitute him in, its, uh, in the proper papacy. Okay. All right. So where does the four days, uh, uh, four hours of darkness over Brittany, uh, what is that coming involved in France in the two days of darkness? First, it was three days minus one or something, or three, three nights minus one. Anyway, it's the four hours of darkness over Brittany, right? And then France and the two days of darkness that will happen before, it's before the three days of darkness, right? Yes. That takes place on Earth. Earth. Okay. Yes. According yeah, to Marie. People Brittany, aren't aware of this. Yes, uh, but the, the four hours of darkness that is exclusively for Brittany, not for the whole world. Okay. Those will be precursor uh, signs for humanity to be prepared. They will be it will be covered by the media, you know, and there will be indeed four hours of complete sheer darkness in only in Brittany, which will not be explainable. Then very few days before the actual three days of darkness, uh, talked about by Padre Pio by the children of Garavandal, by Marie-Julie Jani and others. Uh, there will be two days of darkness uh, that will also be in complete darkness, but it will not be as severe in matter of violence or hearing voices outside the doors. And you won't need to light the proper candles which have to be blessed for the three days of darkness. You won't or you will? You can, but they will be consumed. During the three days of darkness, you can have a little candle this high it will not be consumed. It will last for three days. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. So after those will be precursors, signs of a warning, uh, ask for people to, for the faithful to know that they have to prepare for the three days of darkness. Okay. Now, one of the principal questions I get from a lot of viewers uh, is, well, when shall we know in advance when the three days of darkness will take place so that we can prepare? The answer is yes. Keep in mind that the uh, Conchita Gonzalez. Uh, from Garavandal, and the six children of Medjugorje have all received a certain amount of secrets. So some of those secrets are to be revealed eight and ten days before they take place. There will be signs, there will be warnings, people will know when to prepare. One of the things we know is it's going to happen in a time of, I think, winter. And there will be a very hot wind that will come from the south. And there will be earthquake and you will see that the temperatures will drop, the, will increase drastically. You will see that something is totally abnormal outside. That will be the, and there will be further explanations through the revelations of those secrets. And it will be the time for you, uh, during the three days of darkness, to shut down and lock your doors, your windows, put curtains over your windows. You have to become in complete darkness in the house, not let any light in. When the three days dark. Three days of darkness will begin. It should be three days and two nights, if memory serves. I think I'm correct. And during the third night, uh, it will be still darkness, but it will be a calm and quiet darkness. Those three days of darkness will be a time when hell will be completely empty. All the demons and fallen angels from hell will be released. And if they, one of the principal tasks will be to execute all the enemies of religion, particularly all the enemies of Christ. No? Of what Christ? Yes. Christ. Yes. But the words were used, all the enemies of religion, by my religion, but particularly those of Christ. So there will be a purification of the world. No? During those three days of darkness, everyone will be called to light their 100% beeswax candles and gather around a little altar they will have formed which would have a picture or a statuette of the Holy Family, of the crucifix. And their task will be on their knees to implore God for forgiveness and to pray the Holy Rosary serenely and as quietly as possible in family. During those three days of darkness, you will hear all sorts of horrors, obscenities, banging on the, on the doors, on the roof, on the windows. You will even hear... Uh, some familiar voices who will try to convince you to disobey the instructions of heaven, uh, asking you, begging you to open the door to save them. Under no circumstances whichsoever are you to open the door 
when the three days of darkness begin or end during the course of the three days of darkness. And do we know about uh, what, you know, uh, do we know from heaven about, uh, did they reveal what type, how soon those events will uh, take place prior prior to the final, do we know? Prior to if the heaven, final three days? Do we if know? Heaven reveals the, if heaven has revealed this time frame, he must he, he must have done so with through a secret through secrets to the visionaries, okay. but it has not been revealed publicly not yet. Okay, so let let me ask you a couple of things. We have um, um, we have the passing uh, of Pope Benedict the sixteenth. Can you share with us your thoughts about? Uh, some of the prophecies there that you work with with him. I mean, how this is related to the end time prophecies. Yes, uh, there are two prophecies in particular that I'd like to bring uh, to your uh, viewers' attention. The first one was was through Conchita Gonzalez. Okay. Uh, on one particular instance in Garabandal, Spain, Conchita Gonzalez was speaking to her mother, and um, at the time uh, they could hear the bell of the church of the village church ring. So the mother said, oh, that's odd. This is not the Angelus time. Why is the bell ringing? Immediately, Conchita, who was, uh, they were in the kitchen, I believe, talking. And Conchita, looking in emptiness, answered, because the Pope has passed away, John the twenty third. Hmm. And then she said, uh, still looking and staring in emptiness, after John the twenty third, there will be three Popes, and then we will enter the, type, the end times. Then she corrected herself. She said, well, not three popes, four popes. And one of the four popes will reign such a short amount of time that he will not count. Mm. And that prophecy took place. After John the twenty third, there was Paul the Sixth. After Paul the Sixth, John Paul the First, mm -hmm. who reigned only thirty three days. After John Paul the First, John Paul the Second. After John Paul the Second, Benedict the Sixteenth. So mm. according to that particular prophecy, we have entered the end of times. End of prophecy number two. Okay. Uh, Michelle, uh -huh. Well, I, I, and you cut out there. I was going to say, what about the prophecies? You know, Father Michel or Michael, my, Father Michel Marie uh, Rodriguez. Um, can you shed more light about the warning and the six weeks aftermath, based on on what your research has been? Sure. After the warning will supposed to take place, uh, it will be a new sort of Pentecost, shall we say, which God will grant humanity will be a last chance to convert of the heart, not out of interest. Mm -hmm. In this particular warning, according to Conchita Gonzalez and also according to Marie Julie Jani, it will be a time when every human being on the surface of this planet will be able to see the state of his and her own soul exactly the way God sees it in perfect and complete honesty. Mm -hmm. You will be so shown what not only what you've done wrong, but you will be shown what you should have done and have not done so. In other words, your sins of omission. Mm -hmm. And it will be a last chance for people to finally realize, first of all, for this particular experience, that the only church of Christ is indeed the Holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church founded on St. Peter. All the other Christian nations were founded by men. So the only Christian church founded by Jesus Christ is the Holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church, which he founded upon Peter as the first of his church. Everyone will realize that. And for a period of six weeks thereafter, there will be millions who will make the line to ask for confession. No? But in doing those six weeks of blessings, shall we say, the devil will be prohibited and forbidden to interfere in the affairs of man. Six weeks. Mm -hmm. After those six weeks, uh, he will be allowed once more to influence humanity. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he will endeavor to do will be to influence and bring to the attention of uh, politicians and scientifics that all this mass confusion, that all this was just nothing short but um, universal madness that was caused by one of the most, uh, um, uh, most of one of the greatest solar flares and holy tempest and storm 
ever recorded in history. And this would have indeed damaged uh, all sorts of satellites, uh, machines on Earth through electromagnetic pulsations, and would have affected mass hysteria throughout the globe. And that would be the reason why a lot of people will say, I have gotten fooled. I, I, will, I will abandon this madness, this rubbish I got into. I get and this it. Will be now, I get that. But now we also know from other mystics and uh, I guess and maybe a follow-up book and other uh, prophets and mystics that there's a six weeks from that and there's refugees that people are being called by their angels of lights to go to refugees. Have you heard of that? Or do, can you speak to that? Anything of that from Marie uh, Jolie Jani or or any of yeah. the other um, um, uh, approved uh apparition sites i mean anything of your research and studies that you can speak to yes with me, first of all that will be part of the secrets uh i believe through Conchita gonzalez okay and I believe, i'm not sure about Medjugorje, but uh, with marie julie she mentioned one refuge that will be in the words of the blessed virgin by his own words the most secure place in the whole universe wow where is that that particular region uh will be in the region of Brittany in France, and not just co not too close from the coastal seas, but central Brittany. The coasts, um, the shores of Brittany, will some of them will rise underwater, for the oceans will rise about 35 meters above the level it is today. But Brittany, and I put in my, in my book, a topographical uh, satellite picture of Brittany, the way it looks today, and one, the way it would look, and the third, with a Levels Tides. of the ocean 35 the uh -huh. above. Uh -huh. Britain is practically intact. So, oh. and the Virgin added, there will be refugees that will come from the four corners of the world, like like um, birds that will come flying from the four cardinal points of the compass, seeking refuge within a giant oak tree. Wow. And there will be foreigners who will come there as well. Like a big dome, you know, there's pegged. Just kind of like uh, when uh, the Lord went and we there was blood put on it for the Israelites, you know, to put the blood on the their doors to cover them when the angel of death was going to come and do a massacre. Yeah, uh, the Lord uh, it's a, it amazes me. Uh, the Lord obviously knows the good and the bad, and and those who love him by heart and genuine and want to see his face and want to be all of his and be part of his passion. Uh, actually, I I want to just say this, being part of his passion relieves us of part of our ailments that we have. The more that we get involved with the prayer and his passion, it relieves us of our anguish because he loves us so much. But with that, it just it just brings to my attention anyway to say this that he he wants this is not a time of fear. This is a time of tremendous hope, in the sense that keep praying, be united, use your sacramental, go to mass, go to confession, right? Have peace within yourself so that forgive. For you have to forgive, and then. Uh, love yourself in the sense that you have peace within yourself so you have peace with others even though whatever they're doing you have peace so that you're able to discern what god's truth is right i mean this is my my sense that there's no time for fear there's only uh there's only a time for change you know we know two ends of the rope i know no middle of the rope only two ends excuse me so um uh, this is amazing to me and your book is so timely uh, and it's a great blessing really tremendous blessing i'm gonna pack my bags and i'm gonna come go to Brittany. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> well, but there are places of refugees all over everyone knows that they're preparing for and um anyway um let me ask you oh, go ahead sorry Again, a priest in Quebec, French Canada, Quebec, um, was until recently very famous, and now he's very his subject also to a great deal of controversy. But uh, I do maintain my loyalty to the man. I do believe that he hasn't made a mistake, 
um, he's been reproached and he's working on a community a refuge in Quebec. Okay. He's working on three different communities, but I would Who like to give you permission. Sorry? Who is that? Father Michel Rodrigue. <clears throat> oh, yes. In Quebec. He's building three different communities, which our Lord taught him, told him he is supposed to build to, to open his arms to refugees in the future. Mm -hmm. This man, the Father Michel Rodrigue, first of all, is a priest, has been uh, subject to, as of late, a great deal of controversy because of a prophecy he brought forth about first Pope Francis passing away before uh, Pope Emeritus um, uh, Benedict XVI. Mm -hmm. And uh, Catholic organizations were used to touch back and appear in front of the cameras next to him smiling have completely turned his back, their back on him. I've even, I would go as far as to say I've uh, unfortunately betrayed him with his back, um, which I think is a disgrace. It's wrong. It's wrong. And I think many of us know which platform that is. And I, yes. I, I, I'm not going to waste my breath on that. Um, but because... I just like to point out, for instance, in history, even we don't have to look very far to see when, where God you know, made some of his prophet liars, such as uh, Jonas with Nineveh. Mm -hmm. It was decreed by God that Nineveh was going to be pulverized because of the sins mm -hmm. of his inhabitants. Jonas did what he could. He did everything he could to uh, echo the threats, the admonitions, as Father Laurent would say, to these people. In this instance, it worked. Mm -hmm. And it, it, the inhabitants of Nineveh changed, converted, re uh, seeked redemption, even fasting and having their own animals fast, begging God to forgive him. The fact of what we've learned from this particular experience is that no particular prophecy, no Nothing foretold is written in marble. Everything mm -hmm. can change through prayer, the Holy Rosary, particularly through the sacraments of the, of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And Father Michel Rodrigue was unfairly, unjustly criticized before he was trialed, before he was given a chance to explain himself. That is not my conception of loyalty and certainly not of a friendship. No, no, he's definitely uh, uh, what I call a white martyr. Um, uh, Pope Benedict, I uh, I think Father Michel is right on. Um, I support him a hundred percent. Um, just two last questions. Um, one, can you just tell us <clears throat> about Padre Pio, Saint Padre Pio? Uh, he wrote about Three Days of Darkness, and a lot of the people are unfamiliar. I think uh, what his prophecy was about this in heaven. About uh, the three days of darkness. Yeah, he was very clear on the on two different uh, letters uh, which he wrote uh, to a commission sent by the Vatican. Uh, he very much was in line with the prophecies of Marie Julianie that those three days of darkness will indeed take place during three days and two nights. That we are to pray and remain uh, at home. We are not to look outside during these events. If we do, we will die instantaneously. On the spot because it would be a disobedience god has very clearly stated that it is not his wish for the faithful to see what's going on outside or to see the color or the extent of his anger mm -hmm. no we are to remain obedient we are to remain faithful we have to trust blindly that nothing will happen to us and to stay and concentrate those three days and two nights on our knees if possible mm -hmm. but praying yeah, it's like Sodom Gomorrah. You have to. Exactly. Yeah. Just wanted to make sure that I got the, the affirmation uh, from St. Padre Pio. I mean, this is not a theory out there. This is something that has been, uh, I mean, heaven has outlined this for years. And uh, obviously, we have many um, uh, profound. Uh, researchers and uh, writers and authors who have outlined this for us. I mean, if you don't see it, my goodness gracious, I mean, it's outlined. So let's not be afraid. Let's just do something about it. And that is to look within. And now my last question to you, my dear friend, <laughs> thank you for your patience with it's me. A pleasure. <laughs> so, um, you know, many of the apparitions, Fatima, Garamendal, Medjugorje, Lady of Success, I mean, 
Akita. Everything is the reverence and adoration, an adoration of our Lord, the Eucharist, uh, in the Holy Eucharist. Yeah. So I, my my question is about what are your thoughts about this? Your research has uh, touched upon the abomination of desolation mentioned in the Holy Bible, the abomination of the desolate supposed to happen before and after the warning, you know, related to Eucharist. So can you touch upon <clears throat> the emphasis, heavenly emphasis on, on uh, reverence and adoration of our Lord yes. in the Eucharist? Well, it orbits around one particular frame of mind. Uh, all these apparition sites have one particular um, subject and a reference in common, salvation. And that is why this message, this apparition is, is one, it brings a message of hope and uh, espérance, as we say in French. Salvation can be obtained through heaven. So it's first and it's so what? Prince, you turn around and hear. Okay. Through, through heaven's first emissary, the Blessed Virgin Mary, through the following means. First of all, the Gospels, the Holy Scriptures, and the Gospels in particular. Mm -hmm. Prayer, particularly that of the Holy Rosary, and the Holy Sacraments, most importantly, the Holy Sacraments, especially confession, which heaven, through the Virgin Mary, is asking us to frequent, if possible, once a month. Preferably also once uh, on the first Saturdays of every month. You know? Confession is of imperative, of the utmost importance. And Holy Communion every Sunday. While believing that it is truly the true presence of Christ, the true body and blood, soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And to receive Holy Communion, and this is also of the utmost importance, in a state of grace. Do not receive uh, the Holy Eucharist if you feel or suspect even that you've committed um, a mortal sin, if you have the least suspect, suspect, suspicion you have done something of that nature, restrain yourself from receiving communion, go to Mass, and ask for confession as quickly as possible. There will be blessings if you do so, but it is imperative you go to confession, that you receive Holy Communion, that you pray daily, particularly the Holy Rosary, that you read the Holy Gospels, the Holy Scriptures, and leave your faith and trust your faith in God. Do not criticize, do not condemn. That's a contradiction in our faith, even against people that commit heresy, even those who are unfair, who are unjust, pray for their conversions. That's where the fight is. And today, and I'll finish simply with this, every Roman Catholic, is called to carry the cross the same way our fathers did before us for a new crusade. This crusade is, has not for objective to deliver Jerusalem from Salahuddin, but to deliver Rome, to deliver our hearts from infamy. That's what we are called for. Through the means I just explained, prayer, the Gospels, all the scriptures, communion after confession. That's right. Thank you, Xavier. It's um, really a tremendous privilege and honor. I, uh, You have enlightened us. You have affirmed us. Uh, you have bonded us together throughout the world. Uh, we're toast to this evangelization. Now we will go through all the countries in the world. We thank you. Um, I thank you. Um, and <laughs> Ter I'm terribly humbled by uh, by your words and very gracious. It's a, like the fear of God, the awesomeness of the love of God. So um, I, I will leave it at that. There's so much to absorb and I hope we have you again. And we're looking forward to your, I hope everyone please get his book and read it. And, uh, and we'll look forward to your um, follow up one as well as it will continue. So tonight we uh, wish you well, many blessings to you um, and may the holy angels protect you and guide you. And thank you. <laughs> God bless you all. All right. Good night, everyone. See you soon. See you next time. Thank you. Sadie. God bless thank you. Bye-bye.